In the night of November 4, 2016, police stormed the offices of the pro-Kurdish HDP party in Turkey. Party chief Selahattin Demirtas was among those detained. Being a member of parliament for the HDP means that you're caught between two fronts. The ruling AKP party and President Erdogan on the one side and the PKK on the other. And the two fronts are at war. We have to try to mediate between the two. Thirteen members of parliament were detained. Zia Pir is one of three HDP members of parliament who grew up in Germany, but stood for election in Turkey with hopes of supporting the effort to find a peaceful solution to the Kurdish conflict there. We accompanied the HDP politicians for more than one and a half years. June 2015, Diyarbakur in southeastern Turkey. We're at the final rally of the HDP, or People's Democratic Party, in the center of the predominantly Kurdish city. Tens of thousands of people are here. It's projected that the HDP party will clear the 10% hurdle. That would mean the Kurds in Turkey would finally have their own party representing them in parliament, and no longer just a few independent MPs. On stage, the candidates are introducing themselves, among them Zia Pir. Now a German citizen, Zia Pir was born in Turkey but has close ties to the Kurdish people. His uncle was one of the founders of the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party. Unlike his uncle, Zia Pir only wishes to use peaceful means to fight for the rights of Kurds in Turkey. I said I wanted to go to Turkey and assume responsibility for helping to solve this problem. Because of my own family background, I have a better connection to the people here. The Turkish Republic has had a Kurdish problem since it was founded nearly a century ago. Back then, Kurds, Turks and other peoples in Turkey founded the republic together. But later, the Turkish constitution, as it was written, stated that sovereignty belongs to the Turkish people. That was a deliberate marginalization of the Kurds. And the Kurds have been demanding a seat at the table for 100 years now. One of the candidates is Feleknas Uka. She is Yazidi and grew up in Tsela, Germany. As a member of the German Left Party, she served for some 10 years as a member of the European Parliament. I was here to help set up a women's shelter. I came here almost three years ago. When the peace negotiations began, I hoped I'd be able to apply my political experience here and on behalf of the peace negotiations. I believe the Kurds deserve to finally live in peace and freedom, to finally enjoy the same rights as everyone else. One of the two joint leaders of the HDP was supposed to speak at the end of the rally, but that didn't happen. Not far from the stage, a bomb exploded. It had been hidden inside an electrical transformer. Soon thereafter, a second bomb exploded in the crowd. In the chaos, many feared further explosions and tried to flee across the barrier fence. It was still unclear what had happened. To prevent panic, the crowd was first told that an electrical transformer had malfunctioned. But it was clear that there had been casualties. Although some blamed Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan for the attack, the so-called Islamic State would later assume responsibility. But questions remained. 
We asked the security forces to secure the area 24 hours before our event, but they didn't. So we set everything up ourselves and then asked the police who were standing around, please search everything for bombs and weapons, but they didn't. They just smiled. Ziapir believes the authorities should have been on the alert. There had already been a number of attacks and two recent bombings at HDP party offices. At the rally, there were no police officers to be seen, even though normally such HDP rallies would draw a massive police presence. But outside the square, police did direct tear gas at the crowd to disperse it. The second bomb exploded inside a garbage bin. The bystanders claim it was detonated remotely with a cell phone, showing us what is left of the phone. There were still no police at the explosion site, no one to secure the crime scene or any remaining evidence. Instead, water cannons drove the crowds away and dispersed all remaining traces of evidence. The bombing in Diyarbakur claimed five lives in all. Hundreds were injured. The situation threatened to escalate. The use of water cannons incited even more anger among the crowd. They began moving through the streets, shouting for revenge. The HDP candidates tried to defuse the situation, calling on the crowd to remain calm, even in the face of provocation. Thousands gathered in front of the party office. HDP leader Selahattin Dermitash said that the best response would be made at the ballot box. The next day at the scene of the attack, the crowd was defiant and determined. A determination that would later be echoed in the electoral results. With 13.1% of the vote, the HDP would send 80 delegates to parliament. Despite the violent attacks and accusations from political opponents, who claimed the HDP was a tool of the PKK. August 2015. We are accompanying Ali Atalan, another of the newly elected HDP representatives who grew up in Germany. A Yazidi, he advocates for the rights of minorities. Paramilitary forces in the neighboring villages, which receive weapons from the state through official channels, are trying to lay claim to Yazidi villages, claiming that the villages belong to them. They're doing that to try to blackmail the Yazidi, to extort money from them. We visit Tur Abdin, a Yazidi village. Situated near the Syrian border, it was long home to Syrian Orthodox Christians and Yazidis, but over the past decades, most were driven away. Now a few have returned and are trying to resettle the village, like this family, who have just had visitors from Germany. Atalan listens to their concerns. They're having a problem with water and electricity supplies. In 1985, Atalan and his family fled to Germany. He says that in Turkey, he often witnessed soldiers mistreating people. Meanwhile, he feels ties to both cultures. I've spent more than half my life in Germany. Germany is my second home, and I can't imagine my life without Germany. At the same time, the country where I was born, Turkey Kurdistan, that's also an important part of my life. And I have emotional ties there too. But when it comes to my political values, I'm a European. In Germany, Atalan first worked with the Green Party and later with the Left Party, serving in the state parliament of North Rhine-Westphalia. Why did he come back to Turkey? With my candidacy, I hoped I'd be able to join with like-minded, progressive forces to help democratize the country and to help bring about greater freedom, justice and the rule of law. He's planning to visit two more villages today. He says it's a way to show people their concerns are important. Fall 2015. 
Diyarbakir is in a state of emergency. Clouds of tear gas drift over the historic district of Sursh. Armored vehicles are patrolling the streets. Police have blocked access to the entire district. The sound of gunfire can be heard from across the old city walls. <coughs> Residents are demonstrating against the blockade of Sursh. During the past several weeks, the conflict has flared up again in Turkey's Kurdish regions. As part of his electoral strategy, President Erdogan broke off negotiations with the PKK, claiming that a peace deal with them was impossible. Journalists who come to report on the conflict are unwelcome. We're also forced to be careful. Our hotel is adjacent to the old city wall. We take care not to be seen filming the frequent raids. The following day, the curfew was lifted until nightfall. We go to Sursh to see what is happening there. There are barricades on many streets, erected by young supporters of the PKK, who are still exchanging gunfire with police. Sheets have been hung up to help protect against sniper fire. Residents tell us that ever since the negotiations were suspended, people have been arrested every day. The barricades are intended to prevent further arrests. In the 1990s, Many families who had been driven out of their villages by the Turkish military moved here. Many Kurds in Sirsh are politically active. Nearly every building is adorned with a slogan or an emblem. Traces of the conflict are everywhere. The previous night, a mine exploded here. The insurgents had hoped to destroy a tank with it. The civilian population is suffering under the violent conflict. Many buildings have been damaged. The spiral of violence appears to be escalating. Local Kurds say that the negotiations have been on the cusp of success before the government decided to break them off. Sersha's neighborhood center has been damaged in a fire. The women say it happened during a police attack. It had taken years to build up the center and its many services, and now it's rubble. The cafe, a daycare center, rooms for computer classes, and a clothing drive for Syrian refugees. The pharmacy set up to help the district's needy was also hit. Ziapir is dismayed at the renewed escalation. He's paying a visit to the Liege district, northeast of Diyarbakir. There are soldiers stationed on top of one hill, about 500 or 600 of them, and on top of the other, the insurgents. We said we won't allow you to make war and we'll set up camp right between you. I spent the first week there and saw the brutal battles. Some people were killed there. Most of the protesters have already been here for four weeks. They call themselves a living barrier between the two warring parties. As an MP, you bear responsibility toward the people. We're standing in the middle between the state and the militia, and it's our job to end the war. People from the surrounding areas are supplying the camp with necessities. The women say they've even been shot at from military helicopters. But they are determined to persevere, with the PKK militia on one side and the military on the other. A group of protesters is headed to the soldiers, who plan to turn their small encampment into a larger military outpost. Siapir is at the front of the group, hoping to speak to the unit commander. There are important archaeological treasures on the hilltop that could be destroyed by a larger outpost. But the meeting doesn't take place. Instead, hostilities resume. At first, the soldiers just shoot canisters of tear gas, but soon there's gunfire. Eight protesters have been hit. Two are badly injured. I was standing in front and could easily have been hit. But we owe it to the people. If no one is willing to take risks for peace, we'll never have peace. The protesters didn't reach their goal, but they plan to try to speak with the soldiers again in the next few days. This time, they'll bring a larger group. 
Mufti Arbakur a few weeks later. After the elections, the parties were unable to form a coalition. New elections are now scheduled for November 1st. The three MPs from Germany are once again standing for the HDP. In the Kurdish regions of Turkey, the campaign is being carried out under the shadow of terrorism and war. We have security forces here, and the regional authorities don't even know where they come from. When I look at the behavior and rhetoric of these people, I suspect that they've been trained in the same centers as the ISIS forces. And these people have murdered hundreds of civilians in recent months under the pretext of combating terrorism. The HDP is holding a motorcade rally. The election is in two days, and they want to mobilize support. Zia Pir says that the HDP wants to win as many votes as possible in order to help thwart Erdogan's plans to establish a presidential system. For more than two months, we've been having something much like a war here. Erdogan has seen he can't get any Kurdish votes, so he's trying to get them from the radical right. And they're demanding that he take action against the PKK and the Kurds in return. So that's what he's been doing. The convoy is passing through Ofis, Diyarbakir's business district. But unlike previous campaigns, the MPs are in their own cars this time. Normally we sit in the campaign bus or we go onto the roof of the bus and greet people. But we had to call that off for security reasons. We'd received information that there might be an attack. The campaign has other obstacles to contend with. Most of Kurdistan, where we receive more than 80 or 90 percent of the votes, has been declared special security zones. We've been prevented from going into those areas in recent weeks. We couldn't do any campaigning there, and our voters have all been driven from the districts where they live. The district of Sursh is accessible again, but the buildings bear traces of the fighting. Many people are deeply shocked in the wake of the heavy battles that have taken place here over the past weeks. Feleknas Uka is campaigning in Sursh. She's speaking with the people here on the street. People are in mourning because they've lost everything. Since the 1st of November, we haven't been able to campaign normally. That's why we're campaigning door to door. The people here are living under a terrible threat. They've given us their vote on behalf of peace, so it's painful to see that the war isn't ending. We want to negotiate, but the Turkish state has rebuffed us. I'm glad when I see someone smile and think that maybe they've had a moment of distraction or respite from all this pain. For Feleknas Uka, the visit to Sursh is a highlight. She's very popular here. Despite the threats and attacks, the district is an HDP stronghold. The party usually receives more than 80 percent of the local vote. The children also flash the V for victory sign, a show of support for the Kurdish movement. It's election day. Zia Pir is also going to the polls. For local Kurds, Pir is seen as an important political ally. As a boy of nine, he'd moved with his family to Germany. In the city of Duisburg, he managed a dental technology company. Now he's again a candidate for the HDP, even though back in Germany, he grew up in a politically conservative environment and had once even helped found a lobbying organization for Erdogan's AKP party. Pierre tells the assembled crowd he is casting his vote for peace and good fortune, which he hopes they will all be able to celebrate later that evening. He says the vote at this polling station will presumably be above board. But at some other locations, voters are being intimidated by a large military presence. We have to make sure the soldiers don't see our cameras. This school is a polling station. It's right next to Sersha's burned-out neighborhood center. 
Many locals wonder what impact the military presence will have on the election results. Heavily armed soldiers are also in front of other schools in search. Some even venture into the schools. We're here to meet with Feleknas Uka. Our election laws prohibit weapons in here. These are special units in the building. We'll keep holding discussions to get them to leave because we want a fair election. By early evening, the polls have closed. Locals are gathering to watch the count. At this polling station, the results are clear. More than 80% of votes have gone to the HDP, though many votes weren't included in the count. Ballots are deemed ineligible when voters stamp their chosen party more than once for emphasis, like on these paper ballots. Residents have gathered in front of the polling place to celebrate the HDP's local victory. Zia Pir and Feleknas Uka were both re-elected in Diyarbakir. The mood in front of the HDP party building is celebratory, even though the final results aren't in yet. In the previous election, the HDP won substantial support from the non-Kurdish population as part of a broad leftist coalition that supports democratization in Turkey. The HDP has committed itself to peaceful opposition and rejects all forms of violence and armed insurgency. Despite the mood of euphoria, it's a close call. The HDP barely clears the 10% hurdle. But with 10.8%, they're in parliament. After the election, the war in the Kurdish East continues to escalate. The past weeks have seen many battles between the Turkish military and the Kurdish insurgents, including here in Sirsh. Jan van Aken, a German MP for the left party, has come to visit the area with a group of Kurdish politicians. The battle is raging just a stone's throw away. Zia Pir tells van Aken that the military has now cordoned off the historical district and special units are trying to enter Sush. It's basically a civil war and we're seeing it firsthand. Last night I bolted upright twice because of machine gun salvos. During the day we kept hearing major explosions from that area. The blockade began some two months ago. Peer explains that many civilians are also trapped in Sursh. Do you see the holes on the walls of those buildings? So the police made it all the way to here? During the first incidents, now they're in. They're on all the roofs over there. They also shot at the Armenian church from over there. So that's the Armenian church? People are being killed on both sides here every day. Just 100 meters from here, there's war. They're in tanks, shooting down all the houses on one side of the street so that they can get their vehicles through. Pierre says he's largely given up hope that he or his party will be able to de-escalate the conflict. Our camera crew has to pass through checkpoints, and we're searched. We're only allowed to continue because we're accompanying the MPs. The core of the old town, with its listed historical buildings, has been sealed off from the outside world. A large military presence guards every point of entry. The sound of gunfire is unrelenting, punctuated only by explosions. The military has deployed heavy weaponry. This is normally a lively market street. It's hard to picture how people are living in the sealed-off zones, without water, electricity, heat or food. I knew this was a kind of civil war. Entire districts have been sealed off. But it's different when you see and hear it firsthand, the bullet holes in the walls, the military units driving up in force, the shots in the background. 
The situation in Kurdish areas has also escalated in part because some local municipalities tried to declare communal self-rule after the peace talks collapsed and the wave of arrests began. The Turkish government has denounced this as separatism and as support for terrorism. Residents of the district adjacent to Sursh are also suffering under frequent curfews and blockades. Often there's no electricity or running water. Many just want to leave. Ali Atalan says the situation in other cities is also desperate. We accompany him, headed for Salopi, near the Iraq border. We pass through several military checkpoints, which get more frequent near Jizra. The bus driver is instructed to keep us on board until we enter Iraq. We get only a brief glimpse of Jizra, which has been sealed off for nearly two months. The bus driver lets us disembark in Salopi after all. Until three days ago, the city was under curfew. But the military has Salopi firmly in its grip. Moments after we unpack our cameras, we're questioned, and threats are issued. Finally, we're permitted to pass, but told, no interviews. Nearly every house bears scars from the fighting. The further we go into the district, the greater the damage. The military claims it's been cracking down on terrorists. The official reports make no mention that it's civilians who are bearing the brunt of the fighting. Many here have lost everything. It was war. They shot at us with cannons. Why? We fled. Our home was still in one piece. When we came back, we found this. I have six children. We have nothing to feed them. Now we're living on the street. We can't live here anymore. We have nothing. Our house has been destroyed. For 37 days, eight of Salopi's 11 districts were cut off from the outside world. Some residents were able to flee. Residents say that the military had threatened to use chemical weapons. We're living in misery. No country and no court of law is interested in what's happening to us, our rights and the people who've lost all they had. More than 1,000 homes in Salopi have been damaged. About 100 have been reduced to rubble. Turkey, a NATO partner, has been deploying heavy artillery against the insurgents, calling it a war on terror. But little of the munition remains. Locals say that soldiers swept through the streets and buildings and gathered all the spent munition they could find. We're stopped again for questioning, and once again, we're threatened with arrest. 28 people were killed in the battles of Salopi, many of them civilians. The destruction here rivals the destruction we've come to associate with the civil war in Syria. We continue onward to Nusaybin, near the Syrian border, where we plan to meet with Ali Atalan. The entrance to City Hall is under the watchful eye of police officers next door. The mayor's desk is deserted. Sara Kaya received 91% of the vote here, but Ankara has dismissed her from her post. Because of the state's constant assaults, the city councillors declared an autonomous local government. I was there, so they arrested me. I spent three months in jail. There's still a court case against me. The situation in New Saibin is tense. They've also been threatened with curfews. Residents show us around the area. Barricades have been set up at entry points. The area has already been witness to armed clashes. Nusaibin is a powder keg that could explode at any moment. Armored vehicles are here in force. Not long after we leave, fighting will break out. We make another attempt to reach Jizra. Ali Atalan is here with a group and hopes to enter the sealed off city. He says they've received a call from a family trapped in the rubble of their house. They want to help, but the street is blocked by soldiers. 
A delegation of HDP politicians hopes to convince the commander to let the convoy pass as a humanitarian mission. The presence of foreign journalists helps keep things calm. Ali Atalan says that such situations are often risky, even for MPs. He says many soldiers have little respect for their official immunity. During the negotiations, snipers move into position in the background. Still, the commander won't budge. Instead, more soldiers take up positions. But the convoy doesn't want to give up so easily and leave the injured family to their fate. Ali Atalan wants to prevent any escalation and emphasizes their group is here only to help civilians. We'll get in our cars in five to ten minutes and clear the road. Atalan wants to tell the commander that they've decided to leave, but the commander has already issued orders. The group is enveloped in tear gas, including the members of parliament. Ali Atalan later tells us that as MPs for the HDP, they enjoy no special protections in Kurdish regions. What happened near Jizra is a near daily occurrence. Our camera crew was also targeted with tear gas. Some trucks are now blocking the road to prevent the water cannons from moving forward. The convoy has been forced to turn around, but Ali Atalan later says they will try again to send help to Jizra. In July 2016, Turkey is shaken by an attempted military coup. It's crushed within a few hours and many are killed. It's good that the attempted coup was defeated, but there was a counter coup a coup by Erdogan and his followers. That very same night, they published a list of people they were removing from office. I know some of them, and they have nothing to do with Gülen or his followers. The government just tossed everyone in the same basket, everyone they didn't like. They saw it as their opportunity to purge the machinery of state. If the government doesn't like you, they call you a Gülen follower, a putschist a PKK follower. In the past days, more than 300 people were arrested, all of them are co-workers who had nothing to do with the Gulen movement. Erdogan's coup is running full steam ahead. Now he's ruling Turkey by decree like a king. A state of emergency is imposed across the entire country. Many Kurdish politicians are among those who are arrested. A few weeks later, quiet appears to have returned to Diyarbakir's historical district. The street vendors are back, and cafes and shops are open for business. But even though the battles are over for the moment, armed vehicles still patrol the streets. Traces of the violent conflict are evident everywhere. Some parts of Sursh are still completely sealed off. And journalists are not always welcome. As we film the barricades, police officers intervene, knocking our camera to the ground. Hours of interrogation will follow. Tens of thousands of people were forced to leave their homes. They're living with relatives in their villages or in neighboring cities. And tens of thousands of people are living in tents on the outskirts of those cities. Erdogan is doing nothing to help them return home or improve their living conditions. The Kurds themselves, the city administrations and the HDP, they're the ones taking care of these people. Erdogan is determined to shut down the democratically elected city administrations. Demirtas says resistance was inevitable. We can't accept that our administrations are just being taken from us and that a coup is being carried out against us. Felik Nas Uka tells us the attacks are increasing in frequency. Even MPs are no longer safe from attack. Politics here is very different from what I experienced in the European Parliament. You could express your opinion freely there. Here, the minute you speak your mind, you're arrested or hauled off to court. We've been threatened with weapons. In Surge, the police threatened me. When I get out of the car, they want to shoot. My nose was broken in Silvan when they were under curfew. They started beating us with batons. 
Da haben sie mit Schlagstöcken auf uns eingeschlagen. Uka says that HDP politicians never enjoyed much by way of immunity. In May 2016, nearly all HDP MPs were officially stripped of their immunity, ostensibly for supporting the PKK. We're caught in the middle of two warring parties. We're trying to mediate. So it's genuinely absurd that the government is now accusing us of sympathizing with a terrorist organization. We, the HDP, are paying the political cost, even though we are the only ones trying to prevent this war. The MPs pay a visit to an activist group that calls itself the Peace Mothers, who have been trying for years to end the war. Zia Peer says the group's work is being hindered by escalating persecution. But he says it's important to show people that their efforts are being supported. Feleknes Uka then meets with a women's group. They say Erdogan's government is making life harder for women. Even something like wearing a short-sleeved dress will draw harassment. Attacks on women have increased, bullying has increased. There's a long list of the ways women are being attacked. We decide to pay Ali Atalan another visit in Nusaybin. We want to know more about what HDP parliamentarians are facing in rural eastern Turkey in the wake of the failed military coup. We're stuck for hours on the road near the Syrian border. We're told there's fighting ahead of us, but finally we arrive at City Hall. In the Saiban, the security forces have completely destroyed six entire districts. Thousands of families have been left without a roof over their heads. That's more than half the city's population. What we're seeing here is a catastrophe, plain and simple. These videos of the rubble were taken in secret. It's too risky for us to remain any longer. Our presence has surely been noted at the adjacent police station. The situation for journalists has grown more dangerous in the wake of the failed coup. We accompany Ali Atalan to a meeting in a rural area. He says conditions in the villages have grown increasingly difficult. Mayors have been dismissed from office. City councillors have been arrested. It's become commonplace. Atalan has also received a summons from the state prosecutors. But not all HDP parliamentarians are complying. The rule of law has been virtually suspended under the state of emergency. What's happening here now is just as bad as the failed military coup. Atalan says it's impossible to know what Erdogan is still planning and what the people here will be forced to contend with. Two weeks later, we meet Atalan in Germany. He's on a European visit, attending meetings to inform people of the situation in Turkey. He's spending just two days with his family, a rare visit. His daughter Lorene says the entire family supported him in his decision to stand for election in Turkey. Of course we worry and write to ask if everything is all right. But I also feel bad when I see how people are suffering there. Sometimes we talk on the phone and he tells us what's happening. And then of course it's very worrying. And does he still have any hope that Turkey can be democratized? The political climate was more peaceful back then. We hoped that would continue and Turkey could become a role model for the entire Near and Middle East, a model for democracy, justice, freedom for all. Unfortunately, that was a failure. But I do think it's important not to abandon Turkey to those who would transform this beautiful country into something much like a totalitarian dictatorship. At the moment, though, all signs appear to be pointing toward further crackdowns. Diyarbakir's historical district remains under tight control. Camera crews can only film surreptitiously. The two co-mayors have meanwhile been detained. City Hall and the other municipal buildings have been sealed behind barricades. Elected officials were forced from their posts. Employees were fired. 
An unelected administrator has been installed. Police control all access. We now have more than 38 city administrations and co-mayors of the various cities who have been arrested. What's interesting is that the AKP didn't win the municipal elections, the seats in Kurdish regions. But they're now forcing out the democratically elected representatives and installing their own people. Our hotel also resembles a fortress. The district administration offices are also firmly under the control of the appointed administrator. We have to assume we could be arrested or something could happen to us at any moment. Under Turkey's official state of emergency, you can be held at the police station not just for 24 hours, but for up to 30 days without a hearing. Meanwhile, nearly all HDP mayors have been dismissed from their posts. Many are in police custody. The co-leaders of the HDP and eight other MPs were arrested in early November. We're told that some 5,500 elected officials and members of the HDP have been arrested this past year. In spite of it all, HDP wants Erdogan's coup to finally come to an end. We don't want a country in which everyone is forced to knuckle under to Erdogan's rule. We want a democratic, peaceful society where all people enjoy the same rights. Zia Pir says Europe needs to do more than simply issue statements of concern. He just met with Germany's foreign minister and is due to meet with members of the European Parliament. These are dark days in Turkey. Erdogan does whatever he wants. I believe Turkey is drifting into a one-man dictatorship. If the European Union and Germany too don't start taking a harder line with Erdogan, then I do believe that Turkey will very soon be a dictatorship. In the wake of the April 2017 referendum, those fears have been realized. By establishing his presidential system, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has further consolidated his power.